and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome you all once again into the Puritan Barn for the Midnight Ride with my friend and co-host, John Pounders. Tonight, the ascent of Azazel. I guarantee you tonight there's going to be some information that will strike fear into the heart of the New World Order faster than you can say Canadian trucker. We're going to have information and facts here that are harder to find than Prime Minister Trudeau. So get ready. It all begins right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? Always love to say that, man. I'm always like just waiting, chomping at the bit for David to, David then to give me live. my cue. We're live. <laughs> we're live. <laughs> but yeah, so hopefully you guys have been doing well. Let us know where you guys are at in the chat and also in your comments. We'd love to hear that because it just brings us joy to see you guys all over the entire world and um you know it's been a for those of you that um have been trying to get in touch with us via email anything like that uh three of our team team is out with the uh with the sickness down with the sickness right now and so we've had um you know it's been been hard to kind of keep up with everything so we will get back to all those as soon as possible just remember that when you're dealing with us that it's just been really tough three people at the same time so um just want to be in prayer for them as well and um other than that david how are you doing doing fantastic it's um just great the lord's blessing and i'm excited and um god's good for sure so we want to give a shout out to our sponsors tonight joshua watts leather company uh, some of the best custom leather that's out there i mean joshua watts has done a lot of jobs for a lot of you guys out there and also for us and and we really appreciate his work it's just really stands out um amongst all of the other people out there also we want to give you opportunity to check out nystv.org that is our site where we have documentaries we also have our book of enoch video commentary which is uh, really helpful uh in being able to look at it and look at it through the scope of the bible being able to go through the scriptures and and line it up and david's been leading us on that and it's really been awesome uh if you guys want to try it your first month free coupon code writer i keep saying coupon nobody uses coupons anymore promo code promo code writer and you will get your first month free and if you like it keep it if you don't then get rid of it so but we want to give you guys a chance to check it out nonetheless also sugar and spice soap company uh no more having to worry about rubbing toxicity all over your body or wondering who's making your soap what's what's going on with it there's a company that we value that makes good soap and we're appreciative of that and they also have a midnight ride soap so check them out links are all in description for all of those things also i want to give a shout out to um our artist adam uh, uh man like this picture that he made for this thumbnail on that video just stands out above all other pictures i've seen of this uh azazel and, and i've never seen anything like it they're just an amazing uh, and i know he doesn't like his ego stroked or anything like that but I just want to give credit where credit's due. Just awesome work, man. And every week, I, I just think, man, this is the best ever. And we just say that a lot. And yeah. we do. We love Adam. And the best thing about it, his heart is with us. Yeah. And um, he believes in that message and mission that the Father has given unto us. So true. Well, David, I, that's all I got. I hope, hopefully, uh, you know, we will do our best to give you guys the best content we always do. And we're so grateful that you guys are spending your time with us. Cause we know you could be doing anything. It's Saturday night for crying out loud. And you're listening to us. So we know that you got it. You can't be all bad. So we're, we're appreciative of it. And we, we look forward to hopefully bringing in the midnight ride with you guys. 
and it is always exciting to be here and share content with you, and it's exciting. Nothing excites me any more than studying the Word of God and trying to understand the mysteries of God. And we can understand the mysteries and the deep things of God. Nothing excites me more. And to be able to share it with great folks like you, it makes it just the very, very best. Yeah. Now, the ascent of Azazel, and as most of you know, Azazel was one of the 200 that came down upon Mount Hermon. And we're going to be looking at Azazel and his brood and uh, God's war against Azazel and Azazel's war against God. There's going to be some very important things for us to understand. We're going to begin in Enoch chapter 14, verse 3. He has created and given the mantle of power to, excuse me, he has created and given to man the power of understanding the word of wisdom, so hath he created me also, and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers. Now, Enoch, before the cross, before the flood, when he was a man, just like you and I, he had the power given to him by God to reprimand the watchers when they walked the earth. That's amazing. And it helps us to understand the victory and the power that we have over Aziel and his brood. The children of heaven, I wrote out your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus, that your petition will not be granted unto you throughout all the days of eternity, and that judgment has been finally passed upon you. Yea, your petition will not be granted unto you. And literally the watchers wanted Enoch to intercede for them, because they knew they were in a lot of trouble. Now, the judgment upon them, is that they would not be able to ascend. And uh, this is the judgment that was upon them, the very specific thing. And in the text, I think I do want to read Enoch chapter 14, and I think we do want to read verse 3 with that. Um, Enoch chapter 14 and verse 3. It says... Yeah, no, excuse me, Enoch chapter 14 and verse 5. And from henceforth you shall not ascend into heaven unto all eternity. The specific judgment of the watchers is that they would not ascend. And ever since the judgment has been passed upon the watchers that they could not ascend back up into the third heaven, they have been trying to do just that. And from henceforth you shall not ascend into heaven unto all eternity. And in bonds of the earth the decree has gone forth to bind you for all the days of the world. And in the binding of the watchers, it's similar. It will help us to have understanding as to the binding of Satan. They are bound, but yet they exert spiritual influence over those that are below them in the satanic hierarchy. And they are bound, but yet they will be back, just like Arnold. They will be back. And in John chapter 3 and verse 13, Jesus said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And this scripture here, emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. And if you deny that Jesus is God, if you deny that I am he, according to John chapter 8, you'll die in your sins. So it's a sad state you're in if you deny that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God in the flesh. It's also a sad, sad state if you deny that the Father and the Son both exist. Both of these are damnable heresies. No man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Jesus ascended by his own power up to the right hand of the Father. Now, Jesus allowed Enoch and Elijah to ascend, but they did not ascend on their own power or by their own decision. And since the watchers have been banned 
from ascending into heaven. That is just exactly what they've been trying to do. Go back into the third heaven without Jesus Christ. In Jude chapter 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And this word translated habitation is 3613 in the Strong's. It's the Greek word octarion, and it means a residence, a habitation, a house. And what we have here is an angelic out-of-the-body experience. They had a real, tangible, flesh-and-bone body, but they left their body and they came to earth and we can know that specifically because the word translated here, habitation, in Jude 6, in 2 Corinthians 5 and 2, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house. The same word, octarion. This is the only two times this Greek word appears in the Greek New Testament, which is from heaven, which shows us that the comparison the habitation that they left is compared to the resurrected body that believers will one day receive. So the angels, they had an angelic out-of-the-body experience that they could not return or recover from. And out-of-the-body experiences, they are definitely uh, not of God, and you don't want to fool with it. Now, in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, the history of of the assault of the dark kingdom and the brood of Azazel is that of re-entry into the third heaven. And over and over, because John 3.13 says, no one can ascend but Jesus Christ. Access is denied, but that does not stop them from trying. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4, and they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And this is exactly what the Tower of Babel was about. They wanted to build and ascend to the third heaven. They weren't so dumb to think that they could actually build one that high to the top of the firmament, but they were trying to access a portal. And this is what these little guys do. They want it, and well, they're not all little guys, but they want to find portals by which they can reopen the gates into the third heaven. And for all of you, how many of you saw the midnight ride last week? Just raise your hand. Yeah, I see that hand out there. And I think it was the best midnight ride of all of them that we've ever done. And in that show, John was talking about Baron Von Trump, how uh, he was wrapping himself in lead to go through the portals. And I think that's exactly what little Baron was up to. That's what it's all about. That's what CERN's all about. It's about opening access into the third heaven without God. Mm. And I think, you know, when you look at like NASA and, and all of these people trying trying everything they can, naming their shuttles after Atlantis and Apollo and, and you know, all of these different like gods. And, and you see just some of the, you know, Operation High Jump, all of the Operation Fishbow and all of these, these attempts to make it past the boundaries of heaven, you know, and I, and I don't believe they've done it. I really don't believe it. I, I look at the moon landing to me. That's the fakest thing I've ever seen in my life. I don't, I don't, and, and, and look, I, I make videos, I, I do stuff. And sometimes we use green screen, we use different stuff. To me, that was the fakest video I've ever seen, but they want you to believe that they're doing it right. Cause without the hope that they can ascend into heaven, then there's no, really no hope in, in general, because they know what's going to happen here. They really know what's going to happen here. After we did that show, I started looking into D wave and, and some of the scenario based things. And there's a scenario coming that they can't change. And they've tried over and over again, anything they insert into the scenario, they can't change it. They're trying though. Yeah. They're trying to figure it out. And it yeah. quantum computers. Yeah. That movie minority report with Tom Cruise with the precogs and the predictive programming, predicting what people will do before they do it. And, uh, they're doing that stuff. And, yeah. uh, it, yeah, it's, it's frightening, but it, remember that little Baron Von Trump, he wrapped himself in lead. Yeah. And we're going to see here that Azazel, 
he knew the working of metals. Yep. And I believe that Azazel had special insight into the ability to go through portals. Now, an amazing scripture in the book of Jasher clarifies things for us in Jasher 9 and 25. And the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin. And they began to build it, and whilst they were building against the Lord God of heaven, they imagined in their hearts to war against him and to ascend into heaven. They thought they could ascend into heaven and actually kick God's butt. I mean, there's dumb and there's dumber, yeah. but they really believed that, and they still believe that. Our world believes they are greater than God. They have stuck their thumb in God's eye. They defy him in every way that they can. They think they're stronger than God. But just like the Tower of Babel came down, this whole New World Order abomination, it's going to come down. But it's amazing that in the book of Jasher, they wanted to storm the very throne room of God. Mm. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. But this is the heart of satanic rebellion taking over the third heaven. And they have never access denied. Every time they've tried, access denied. Here's another fellow that tried, Lucifer. And many people believe that Lucifer is Satan. The Bible doesn't say that. So one of my rules I live by, I teach what's in the Bible and not what's not in the Bible. And if the Bible said Lucifer was Satan, I'd say that too, but it doesn't. Lucifer, oh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Literally, in the Hebrew, Hallel ben Shahar, son of Shahar. And angels don't have daddies, but Lucifer has a daddy, and his daddy is Shahar, which is a well-known Canaanite god that was worshipped at the time that Joshua took the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Lucifer was a Nephilim, and he tried to ascend to the throne room. And it goes on, it says, For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. Just like Jasher 9.25, they wanted to ascend into heaven at the Tower of Babel. That's what Lucifer wanted to do, too. He thought he could storm the throne room. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Lucifer had a go at it, but he got smacked like a bug and went right down into the pit of Sheol. Access denied because John 3.13 states, only Jesus has that power to ascend into the third heaven and to him that he would enable to do so. Now, we're going to look at the judgment of the fallen ones and of the 200 that came down. And uh, you can remember Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Enoch chapter 6 talks about the 200 that came down upon Mount Hermon in the days of of Jared. Now, this is the judgment upon Shemjaza, and we're going to see that there's something unique about Azazel, because Azazel receives a completely different judgment than Shemjaza and the rest of the 200. And we're going to understand what is special about Azazel. In, in Enoch, in the text, it says, And the Lord said unto Michael, Go bind Shemjaza, and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them all in their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another, and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for seventy generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. Now, for all but Azazel, they were to be bound for 70 generations. So can we figure out just where we're at in relationship to the binding of the 70 generations? Well, we can get a pretty good idea. In Psalm chapter 90 and verse 10, there have been attempts made to calculate the 70 generations of the binding of the fallen ones in the book of Enoch. 
by using Psalm 90 and 10. It says the days of our years are three score years and ten, or seventy, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, or eighty, yet it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Now, in Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, it says some people live seventy years, some eighty. And here's the problem with defining a generation. Some people have uh, families that they have diabetes and heart trouble running the family, and it's not uncommon to have people in some families die at 50 and 60 years of age with heart attacks. Other families, a generation is longer because they have good health. They live into the 80s and 90s. So a generation in different families is different, and some have attempted to take the low number here of 70 years and use Usher's chronology to calculate the 70 generations as 70 times 70 years, and they came up with the figure around the year 1900. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. It, one of the problems is there's no clear definition of a generation here in Psalm 9010, and you have to take 70 to make it even come out in our time, and 80 won't even work. Now, that's with using the numbers in Bishop Usher's chronology. But we're going to show you what I believe is a much better definition of generation. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, it says, But in the fourth generation they shall come thither again, for the iniquity of the Ram Amorites is not full. And it's referring to the 400 years that the of children of Israel was, would sojourn in the land of Egypt. Now, this would give the definition, and in Whedon's commentary, he has this opinion, and others do also. Mr. Whedon said this. He says, evidently, by reckoning 100 years as an average generation among the patriarchs. Matthew Poole and other commentators agree. Poole said a generation at that time was reckoned at 100 years. And since the book of Genesis uses the word generation, I think this is a much better definition of generation for the Israel of God. And also, I think it's confirming that in Genesis chapter 21 and verse 5, it says, And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. So I think the number 100 is a much better number to start with than the 70 or 80 for a definition of just how long a generation is in the Word of God. Now, let's look at some problems. There are problems, and Bishop Usher did a good job. I mean, he did an amazing job, and it gives us a point of comparison. We get a general idea of which came first and about how long things were, uh, were between different events, but there are mistakes in Usher's chronology. And even Henry Morris, who was the father of the young earth creationist, he believes and he taught that there were gaps, big gaps, in the chronology. Now, what amazes me is there are still young earthers that will put you in hell if you don't believe that Adam was created in 4004 B.C., and they need to read the father of the young earth movement who admitted that there were thousands of years that the usher's chronology could be off. Let's give just one example. On, in his book, The Genesis Record by Henry Morse, he has this to say. He says, Many writers have argued that one or more gaps of unknown magnitude may be assumed in these lists, especially in Genesis 11. At the outside, it would seem impossible to insert gaps totaling more than about 5,000 years. So Mr. Morris said it could be 5,000 years, but I don't think there's no more than that. So the father of the Young Earth Movement admitted 
that these chronologies, because of the gaps, and we're going to show you one, they could be off for more than 5,000 years. For, and for all that are paying attention here, all of these theories of 7,000 years of human creation of a day equals 1,000 years and all those date-setting schemes, all of those are wrong, and they cannot be right. He goes on to say here, Consequently, the Bible will not support a date for the creation of man earlier than about 10,000 B.C. Mm. So the father of the young earth movement admits that Adam could have been created 10,000 B.C. While today there are people in the young earth movement will put you in hell if you don't believe it was 4,004 B.C. Now, Usher did a good job. That ain't Usher's fault, but he did not consider the gaps, and there are gaps there. Henry Morris goes on to say, and this is on page um, 309, he says, if gaps are allowed, these di dates might conceivably be increased to say up to about 1,000 years or more, possibly 5,000 years at the very outside. And he's talking here about the flood of Noah. So these dates could be off by more than 5,000 years. So what does that mean? If you understand the figure 100 giving 70 generations as 7,000 years, that means that we could be smack dab in the middle of the release of the fallen watchers. And has anybody noticed things getting a little bit crazy out there? The, the craziness it's just crazy on steroids. And I think we're having a release from the dark kingdom that is just going to escalate until the full remover of the restrainer and the release of the abyss, of the abyss in Revelation chapter 9. Now, is there anything you want to weigh in here, John? And I know we were talking earlier about, you know, and a lot of people, they think the good folks of the younger creationists hung the sun and moon and not the good Lord. That's almost that bad. They follow. Yeah. It's like the young earth Vatican, yeah. but they are also, we disagree with them severely on the issue of biblical cosmology. And it just seems like they totally miss it. And not only do they miss it, but they fight against it. Yeah. And I think, I think there's a reason for that for sure. And I think we, we've talked about that reason many times, but I think, it's weird because, you know, they will literally, if you don't believe in young earth creationism, you are considered a heretic. They also uh, deny evolution, which I deny as well. And they'll say that the scientists are off on that. But everything else, let's trust the science on, right? Except for except for the things that they take and they hold in as, as fact, 100% fact. You know, and when you look at the cosmology of the earth, there's way more evidence of a biblical earth cosmology which being a pretty much a flat earth with a dome around it uh enclosed system that sit on pillars is all over the bible you won't find any verse that says it's a globe spinning around through space you won't find it okay i'm not saying all i'm saying is that's what the bible says you can you can disagree with me all you want but you can't disagree that that's what the bible says and in fact i i challenge you to look at every scripture that has to do with the shape of the earth, the cosmology of the earth, how the earth was formed, the firmament, all those different things. And you find one verse that says the earth is a globe flying through space and I'll, and I'll give you a cookie. You know what I mean? But there's nothing that people always say the circle of the earth, a circle is not a globe. Uh, and I don't want to go into all the arguments about all this stuff. Cause look, to me, it's like the Bible says what it says about it. It's, it is what it is. You know, this, to me, this is what it is. And, and see that, or I trust NASA. I trust the science on all of these different things, but we got to remember that science and this is science falsely so-called the real science real what we want to call real science is testable you test it over and over again people look at it and they say okay yeah this is this this works we've done it like 10 times and it works but science has become just this big magical theory about everything everything's a theory you know theory this theory that and we have to trust the words of of a few people that um are running the show when it comes to cosmology right now. And I'm, I'm just not down with that. But the young earth creation is no different. When you have the the creator of the idea of young earth creationism saying that he could it could be off by this much, you have to at least give it a little bit of weight, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and there's door number two. You can go through door number two, and over door number two is 
Yes, I know the Bible says that the earth is flat and stationary, but I choose to believe NASA over the Bible because that's just symbolism. You see, now the Bible, it's outdated, and they did the best they could, bless their hearts, and uh, ever, you know, and the problem with that is you're talking about hundreds of scriptures that you have to say, well, the Bible is just symbolic or whatever you want to make up. I know what the Bible says, and there's one guy out there, and boy, we could drop names here, but there's one guy out there, he'll teach it even with the pictorial representations, just like the Bible says, and then he'll say, but oh, it's not like that. Yeah, It's like NASA is. That disgusts me. It's almost like God's too stupid to, yeah, to, yeah. to tell us, because there is a word for ball in, in Hebrew. Yeah. There's a word for circle in Hebrew, but he used, yeah. chose to use that one word. It's like God's too dumb. It's like we're too dumb to dis- he's to describe the globe earth to us, so he makes it makes yeah. up this big, wild theory all throughout every single book of the Bible that fits together <laughs> somehow, but it's all just just a mess. Anyways, yeah. I'm going to And, and the Holy box. Ghost, the author of Scripture, he probably didn't know what it was really like. I mean, yeah. it's insulting. Yeah, It's insulting is what it is. And I, as you can tell, I can get just a little bit of an attitude about the whole thing. But let's show one gap, and let's begin to think about why the gap was. And we're going to show you just one gap, and there are several we could show you. Uh, one fascinating gap is in the days of Peleg, when the earth was divided around Pangaea. Up until that time, we had very long lifespans, and then they jump down in what appears to be one generation in Genesis 10 to like only 400 years. That's a big gap and a big jump, and I got a lot of ideas I'm thinking about on the gap of Pangaea, but that's for uh, in the days of uh, Peleg, in Pangaea, but that's another show and another other ideas. But here's one we can look at, Luke 3.36, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sem, which was the son of No, which was the son of Lamech. Now here, there's a son of Arphaxad listed as Canaan. Canaan does not appear in any of the Old Testament genealogies. This proves, according to the Word of God, that the Usher chronological dates are wrong. And there's many places where we could show that because there's gaps in the genealogy. Here's one we can prove in the Genesis 11 genealogical tables. Now, why was there a gap? Why was Canaan left out of the genealogies in in all of the Old Testament genealogies in the Hebrew Masoretic text? And when the Bible does genealogies, when it says this person begat that person, it could be talking about the grandson or the great-grandson. This wasn't accepted in the way that genealogies were done. But let's ask ourselves, why was this person, Cain on left out of all the genealogies in the Old Testament scriptures? Now, let's go to the book of Jubilees, and this is very interesting. In the 29th Jubilee, in the first week, in the beginning thereof, Arphaxad took to himself a wife, and her name was Rasuja the daughter of Susan, the daughter of Elam, and she bare him a son in the third year this week, and he called his name Cain-am, or Cain-am, the same fellow we just read about in Luke 3, 36. And the son grew, and his father taught him writing, and he went to seek for himself a place where he might seize for himself a city. And he found a writing which former generations had carved on the rock, and he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it and sinned owing to it. For it contained the teaching of the watchers in accordance with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and moon and stars and all the signs of heaven. And he wrote down, and he wrote it down and said nothing regarding it, for he was afraid to speak to Noah, lest it should, lest he should be angry with him on account of it. 
And in the 30th Jubilee, in the second week, in the first year thereof, he took to himself a wife, and her name was Melchah, the daughter of Madai, the son of Japheth. And in the fourth year he begat a son and called his name Salah. For he said, Truly, I have been sent. Now, isn't it interesting that this fellow that's left out, he finds the stone with this fallen angel information. It's absolutely amazing. And what, and we don't know exactly what it was, but we know that this guy was left out of the Old Testament genealogies. We know that this fella, Canaan, did not have corrupted genetics because he is in the genealogy of Christ. But it appears that what he found on this stone, whatever it was, that it caused a big problem with his children and with his descendants because there's a gap here of people that are left out of the genealogical record. How long this gap is, we do not know, but we do know there's a gap here, and we have an idea, a very good idea, why this gap took place. So these are the things that Bishop Usher did not take into consideration. So we have to understand this, and when we understand this, we can get a clear picture of with that hundred-year figure, we are right in the middle of the time prophesied in the book of Enoch for the release of these watchers and also for the release of Azazel. I think too, the, like the predictive programming is there too, you know, because we've been really dealing with that in the last just few months, just looking at all this stuff. You know, they, they've had a space force now. They've uh, really been ramping up disclosure. I mean, this has been, uh, they've finally admitted that they're spacecrafts. They don't know what, what they are. They don't know how to get to them. They can't re you know, they can't get them. And, you know, we know uh, there's so many things that you could get into in the show. Like there's so many rabbit trails to go down, yeah. but when you look at Germany and their and their escape from Germany, all of the sci the scientists that were you know put into office here in the United States, and then the ones down in Argentina and the and the huge base uh, in what was it called New Schwabi Land in in yeah. Antarctica, and we know that they had these crafts. I mean, we we've, we've talked about it so many times, but there's there's this big, I think the Fourth Reich and all of this stuff has something to do with all this and i think that they really knew what was going on when it comes to that if you look at their literature and you look at what they were trying to do like i believe that they're really trying to go into the earth find azazel and bring him back up you know i think that that's what they're trying they've been trying to do all this time trying to find this the scapegoat you know yeah uh, it's crazy yeah i absolutely believe that i absolutely don't now Let's look at something else here in the book of Enoch, chapter 10 and verse 9. And in our book of Enoch commentary, we went through each one of these chapters verse by verse. We really unpacked it. And for those of you that want um, more information here, this is some of the most fascinating stuff of all to me. I love it. And over and over again, we see the book of Jubilees and the book of Enoch giving us clarity and help us to put together and connect the dots into just exactly what's happening. Just like the book of Jubilees there, it gives us real insight. Well, why is this guy in Luke and not in uh, Genesis 10? And we have a real good understanding of why he's not there. Now in Enoch chapter 10 and verse 9, And to Gabriel said the Lord, Proceed against the bastards and the reprobates, and against the children of fornication, and destroy the children of fornication, and the children of the watchers from amongst men, and cause them to go forth. Send them one against the other, that they may destroy each other in battle, for length of days shall they not have. And hear the judgment upon them that uh, was brought about with the help of of the, the angelic assistance is that they would fight and destroy one another. Well, this actually happened. There was actually a war amongst the watchers and their descendants that we can actually find a record of in history. Now, this is the commentary on Enoch by George Nicholsburg, and I just want to read a little excerpt from this. And we've all seen this. We've seen it 
all over our movies. We know this story, but what people need to understand that this is actually the fulfillment of that which was prophesied in the book of Enoch, and the way to understand this is to see what we see in the Word of God. Now, it says here on page 221 of this book, he says, Prometheus and the Titan Omachia in Acesilus Prometheus bound, the rebel Titan is taken out to the wilderness. And the rebel Titan is a picture of Azazel the scapegoat. It's just given a different name. It says where he is chained hand and foot to the side of a cliff. Where we're going to see Azazel is bound and thrown down a cliff. And this was a part of the ritual of the Day of Atonement. And this is all symbolized in detail in the story of the Titans. And the rebel called Titan was the uh, actual counterpart or the fulfillment of Azazel. And this is where the whole story is. And it says, because of his continued insolence against Zeus, the high God opens the rock and entombs Prometheus. So Prometheus is also a very much a type of Azazel. And we've got the movie Prometheus and all about transpermia um, of the, the human race starting from the alien sperm and all that stuff. And it goes on to say here, According to the myth of the Titomachia, Zeus sends 300 handed giants against the Titans because they have been making war on him. Here we have Zeus and the Titans fighting. That's just what the book of Enoch said was going to have. Their judgment is they fight with another, one another. And we even see uh, the entity called Titan and Prometheus specifically, down to minute detail, fulfilling what was said about Azazel in the book of Enoch, and also we're going to see in the book of Scripture how he was bound, and we're going to look specifically here at the binding of Azazel and how it differed from that of the others that came down on Mount Hermon. But, I, you know, this is amazing. Yeah. It's it's all over our movies. Yeah, and and, I, and and it is all over the movies. I mean, every pretty much every, in my opinion, and this is, I, I know your opinion as well, and and probably many of you that watch because you guys watch so much and you see some of the same scenery over and over and over again through different things. You know, even so right now there's people that are saying, well, what does Azazel got to do with the Bible? What does this got to do with anything? But really it has a lot to do with the Bible. You find the word Azazel uh, translated as scapegoat in the Bible many, many times. In fact, the Day of Atonement, the one of the cornerstone rituals of this is allowing this scapegoat out into the wilderness so that the Azazel takes him, right? This is the this is the whole cornerstone of that thing. All of this stuff plays hand in hand, and you go through ancient religions, uh, you know, such as uh, just pretty much every ancient religion, there's, there's this ritual shows up on all of them. Why? Because originally everything came from the same exact people, right? Who were the first people? Yeah. They were the first people were God's people. Yeah. And it just, and people always say, well, they're copying this or that. No, it's the other way around. It always has been. In my opinion. That's so. exactly right, John. Yeah. And this has everything to do with everything. Because just like John said in Leviticus 16, and we're going to show you some text here before we're done, scapegoat is Azazel, the most perfect picture of the cross in all of the Old Testament, the most perfect in type and symbol is the Day of Atonement. Yep. The most perfect, the Day of Atonement is the perfect prefiguring of the cross. There, Azazel was bound just like Enoch had the power to reprimand the watchers. How much more do we in Christ have power over the fallen powers? We need to understand, and we don't need to be haughty. You know, I always say here in the first heaven, that which, uh, what comes against you, give them the word and give them the name. The book of Psalms says that the word has been exalted 
above the name. Give them the word, give them the name, do like Jesus, quote Deuteronomy to the devil, and in the name of Jesus put them out. When doing spiritual warfare in the second and the third heaven, we must be careful when dealing with these higher level entities. The Lord rebuked thee, just like in Jude 6, when Michael was disputing about the body of Moses. But let's look at Enoch chapter 10 and verse 4, and we'll see in the binding of Azazel a lot more fascinating things and a lot of fascinating things we can look up for. Now, we saw the rest. You can read Enoch chapter 6, and you can see Azazel was one of the 200 that came down, as was Shemjaza. But Azazel gets special treatment, and we're going to get more understanding why Azazel is treated differently. In Enoch 10 and 4, and again, the Lord said to Raphael, and notice here, Raphael, we're going to see more of the angel Raphael uh, before we're done here. A very big guy. He is one of the big four. And again, the Lord said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert, which is Dudiel, and cast him therein. And in the very place where this actually happened. This is where on the Day of Atonement, the scapegoat called Azazel was released into the wilderness. Not a coincidence. And when we understand that, we can understand the binding of Azazel. And it's, it is just awesome. It just, it just blesses me to no end. Now, what's special about Azazel? In Enoch 8 and 1, and Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates. I wonder if Azazel would be able to create a super weapon, John. <laughs> I would say so. We, we were talking on the midnight ride last week about the Tesla papers, how they came from John Trump to Donald Trump, how uh, Tesla was talking about uh, being uh, in negotiations with uh, Britain and the Soviet Union of a super weapon that he had created. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unreal, man. I, I think, I, you know, this whole idea of, of Azazel being possibly they've found him and unleashed him or he's been unleashed and, and who knows how long ago they found him. I've heard weird stories before. You know, I've heard this, there's this old story that went around. I'm sure you guys have heard it, but where this military presence actually goes inside of this cave and finds this presence and, and all of them die inside this cave. I wonder, I, I wonder like how intertwined that, uh, you know, the, the vril and all of that stuff is with, with him, you know? Oh, yeah. So, and boy, we're going to get to the real before we're done either. And yeah. look at the next thing it says here. And breastplates and made known to them, the metals of the earth. You know, last week also, uh, you were talking about little Baron Von Trump wrapping himself in lead mm -hmm. to get through the portal. Well, maybe Azazel has some fallen angel knowledge about metals going through portals and the yeah. making of super weapons. Yeah. Maybe this is part of the reason why the little fella uh, gets some special treatment here. Well, and I believe we, that that is indeed the fact. I, I think so too. And we know that there were super weapons way back in, in time, you look at the Vedic texts, for instance, though, probably one of the oldest texts in existence. In my opinion, after reading it, I truly believe that it was written by one of the watchers. I, I think there's no doubt in my mind. And this is, you know, when going back to Tesla, Trump and all that, Tesla gave all of his credit for all the information from stuff from the Vedic texts. You know, the, the Mahat and the Prana, like all of that has to do with the terminology used in the Vedic texts in order to access these entities or access this knowledge that is is going through there and when you when you look at the vedic text getting back to my point there is a group of rishnis that literally are destroyed by this weapon and it's and it describes the weapon as this weapon uh this cloud that that forms and it looks like a parachute within a parachute with it's like a parachute cloud and all of the rishnis were wiped out while they were standing and some of them were left standing, you know, like where they were, like they were just completely like with this big cloud of, of, and you see it in Sodom and Gomorrah as well. You have this, and, and a lot of these weapons, people think, oh, God doesn't use regular weapons like we use, but we don't understand that a lot of our weapons literally came from 
secrets, magic secrets from yeah. the watchers, right? All yeah. of the, all these stuff. So a lot of the things that we think aren't supernatural might very well be. I mean, this might literally be the black mirror, the the mirror that people used in ancient times, something like yeah. this, right? I mean, it, it's so crazy to think about, but it's yeah. so, it's and and the metaverse. Yeah. Uh, could the metaverse actually be something that the real design is going through portals? Um, I think it's possible. And I remember we did a show, we've done several shows, but we did a show on ancient technology and we talked about the green glass that you find in the Sahara desert yeah. and other places the, to have the only thing that can produce enough heat to turn sand to green glass yeah. is nuclear fission. Yeah. And we talked about uranium mines in South Africa that are antediluvian. There's things out there that there's facts that really are problematic to maintain the party line that is taught by science falsely so-called. And they do that because they don't want us to understand these things. I firmly believe it. They are lying to us and deceiving us about so many things on a regular basis. And I just pray that, you know, we could talk to a young earther and they would agree, oh my goodness, that if you even say that uh, evolution might be a lie, you'll be fired from your job. And to the extent that the so-called educational institutions will go to show uh, evolution's a lie. Well, why is that? Is that really the only thing we're being lied to about? Yeah. I mean, you think? Um, Dude, I, I'm starting to wonder if anything we've been told is the truth at all. Not just have we been lied to, is have we ever been told the truth is what I'm wondering at this point. You know, the, the, you know, you know how we've been looking at stuff and, and it's just not, some of it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. It's a hard pill to swallow, I think, because somebody coming from me and I know you always love to study history, you always love to study it. But can, can we really even trust any of the stuff that they're telling us, you know? No. And the bottom line is we have truth right here. That's where we have truth. Yep. We don't have truth anywhere else. Truth is a person, and the doctrine of Christ will take the Holy Spirit to guide us into other truths. And there are other uh, texts that confirm and help us get to the truth, but uh, we're not getting the truth uh, from the, the media, the educational institutions, and we're not getting the truth from the church. No. And we're just not. Don't look for it. If you want the truth, you got to go back to the book and the man that is truth. Truth is a person. And if you want the truth, you start with him. And until you do, you don't got the truth. Now, Enoch chapter 40, verse 7. We're going to look a little more at this angel Raphael, who is not mentioned by name in Scripture, but we're going to show you Raphael clearly in Scripture and just what he has done and what he's going to do. In Enoch 40 and 7, And I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. Now, unless you listen to uh, now you see TV or FOJC radio. You've probably never heard anyone else talk about the Satans. There are five Satans or seraphim mentioned in the book of Enoch. There are two in scripture, Satan and the Assyrian. There are seven and the seraphim encourage the angels to leave their bodies, go to earth and cohabitate with human women. That's something that we've done entire shows on multiple shows of documenting this for you and here again in the Enoch commentary uh, we unpack this in great detail now Enoch chapter 48 and 9 we're going to see that uh, once again Raphael is one of the big four it says one of the big four angels that attacked the seraphim you see the fallen seraphim is the top of the dark side pecking order and the father has four angels that are assigned to directly take care of them guys and believe me they can handle them not to worry and it says here in Enoch 48 and 9 after that I asked the angel of peace who went with me who shewed me everything that is hidden who are these four presences which I have seen and whose words I have heard and written down and he said to me the first is Michael 
the merciful and long-suffering, and the second, who is set over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men, is Raphael. He is the one that bound Azazel, according to Enoch chapter 10. And the third, who is set over all powers, is Gabriel. And the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope of those who inherit eternal life, is named Phanuel. So when we see Raphael, who took care of Azazel and bound him in Enoch 10, he is one of the big four that are, is at the very high of the good angelic pecking order. He is one of the big four guys right up there with Michael Gabriel and Phanuel. And we're going to see this continued history of Raphael, he not only bound Azazel to begin with, but he continues to deal with the seed of Azazel as Azazel and his brood continually tried to ascend. Aziel, Azazel was judged, he was bound, he was thrown in the pit, you shall not ascend. And all of his brood, which we're going to get a good picture of who his brood is, all they want to do is defy God and ascend, just like the Tower of Babel, just like Jasher, just like uh, in, in the book of Jasher when it says they wanted to storm the throne room, just like Lucifer in Isaiah 14. In the book of Tobit, now when's the last time you've had your good scripture from the book of Tobit? Now the book of Tobit, not the Hobbit, but the Tobit, this is a book that was originally in the King James Apocrypha, and we're going to read some text here that will give us more insight into the angel Raphael. And while here again we do not hold the King James Apocrypha to the same standard of Scripture, but in the non-canonical books, the King James Apocrypha, the book of Enoch, are right there at the top. And the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees would also be texts that we would look at. So we've got some very credible material here that was originally in the first edition of KJV. But let's read it. Tobit chapter 3 verse 7. It came to pass the same day that in Ekbante, a city of Mediasara, the daughter of Raguel was also reproached by her father's maids, because that she had been married to seven husbands, whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed before they had lain with her. Dost thou not know, said they, that thou hast strangled thine husbands? Thou hast already seven husbands, neither wast thou named after any of them. Now, I believe that Asmodeus is of the brood of Azazel, and I'm going to show you why in, in this next text. In this next text, it says, And Raphael was sent to heal them both, that is, to scale away the whiteness of Tobit's eyes, and to give Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, for a wife to Tobias, the son of Tobit, and to bind Asmodeus. We see in the book of Enoch that Raphael bound, As bound Azazel, and here we see Raphael binding Asmodeus. And I believe that it's kind of like the father said, you know, take care of him and whatever comes from him, and you just take care of the light work. And here we see Raphael in the book of Tobit binding Asmodeus, a little bit more about him in a moment, the evil spirit, because she belonged to Tobias by right of inheritance. The selfsame time came Tobit home and entered into his house, and Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, came down from her upper chamber. Now, there's something here that's amazing to me, and always the more you study, the more you find. I've never talked about this before, and I believe uh, that ass worship, and I'm not being crude here, I'm talking about a legitimate form of worship that was called, well, it's not legitimate, it was demonic, that was called ass worship. And this ties in with the worship of the head of the ass, they worship the head of the goat, and this is the precursor to the worship of the Baphomet. The head of the donkey was worshipped before the head of the ass. And these 
ass worshippers from Asmodeus, that they are the worst of the worst. They are the underbelly of the satanic perversion. But I'll read an article here from the Jewish Encyclopedia, and that's where the picture John put up here comes from. It comes from the Jewish Encyclopedia 1903, and they have an article on ass worship, and who'd have known? But it says here in the Jewish Encyclopedia, and it, it talks about uh, that uh, Tertullian accused the Christians of having an at the Christians worshiping an ass's head of their god. And it talks about a graffiti that was found in Rome in 1856 representing a man bearing the head of an ass and nailed to the cross before whom another man kneels in the attitude of of adoration and here in this picture this is an actual drawing that came from the uh, first century and it shows here somebody mocking Christ on the cross and Christ is being depicted as a donkey on the cross and this is what is meant by ass worship and they accused the Christians and the Jews of worshiping the head of an ass and this was the precursor and you see this was actually done in the mystery religions and it was also done by another group that we've talked about before now you see in the upper right hand of this picture there's like it looks like a Y this is the mark of the Sethian Gnostics and we've talked about the Sethian Gnostics in shows we've done they were the most vile, disgusting of all the Gnostic sects, and they were the ones that worshipped Barbello. And the mockery and the hatred and the virulence toward real Christianity, they would slander and attack real Christianity while proclaiming to people that they are Christians and that they, uh, they're the ones that have the real truth. Oh no, Jesus isn't God. And, uh, and all of this stuff. But I find this just absolutely amazing. Now, in the text here, in the Jewish Encyclopedia, it says, Typhon, it says that it is a symbol of the Typhon Seth worship. And Typhon was one of the antediluvian chaos monsters. We've talked about that before. It says of the Seth Typhon Seth worship, for on the numerous curse tablets in Rome, the same symbol always stands at the right hand of the ass's head of Typhon Seth. And they would make magical curses with the same mark on it, and they would curse and do satanic rituals against the true believers. And they would do everything they could to bring in these Gnostic doctrines into the Israel of God to pollute and defile it. That's why here at Now You See TV and FOJC, we fight against this demonic stuff with every bit of energy that we have. And I wish we could got more of that out there, but you're not going to get that very many places. And I don't know any other place, quite frankly, that's going to fight against this demonic nonsense like we do. This is evil. It's the very bottom of the pit of black magic and of all that is evil. This same spirit is coming against us right now as we speak through the hordes of Azazel that are trying to defile and ruin and ascend back into the third heaven, even as I'm relaying these things to you right now. Mm. I'm into that. It's interesting. You know, I was looking, just looking up to some of this, this Amala tree is what they're calling it here. And, and in uh, the Journal of Hellenic Studies, it talks about them, um, they find these donkeys near sacrificial pits and several carved, gem, uh, uh, carved gems showing people wearing donkey heads and skin, uh, all of this different stuff. And, you know, this is interesting, but I lived, used to live in South Texas and, and witchcraft was pretty popular down there because there's like a mixture of like witchcraft and uh, Catholicism, they call it like Santeria, you know, right yeah. down around and there. Yeah. And I remember one time we had, we had donkeys and, one time when I was a child, I was probably 10, 
10 to 12 years old but we went over there where we kept our donkeys and somebody had sacrificed that donkey there was literally a sacrifice of that donkey and the donkey head was laying there it just made me think of that when you're talking about it i don't know if there's anything any any uh, relevance to that but it's just very interesting to say the least yeah the donkey is considered a phallic animal yeah just like the goat and uh the and the older tradition is of the worship of the donkey head before the worship of the goat head which we're going to see the worship yeah. of the head which it, we're going to pick it up in the knights templar how that came up into the the modern wave of things but we're going to look a little bit more at asmodeus and we'll understand a little bit more the role of raphael and his war with asmodeus and all the seed of azazel but this is a book entitled the testament of solomon the king this book is toxic it's not from the good side it's from the dark side and it tells us about asmodeus and that's what we want to know we want to know what asmodeus and his role on the dark side is we're going to see how the good side fights it and we're going to see how we have the victory and we smack down azazel and all of his hordes now we'll read just a little <laughs> excuse me We'll read just a little bit from the Testament of Solomon. We'll pick up some text in chapter 5. And in this text, Solomon, and you know, Solomon, he went, he went south. He went, he went south. That's all you can say. He went deep into uh, foreign wives. If those wives would sacrifice their firstborn child um, to, to Moloch. And it was just, it's not a very pretty story. And there were many, and of course, Freemasonry, they traced their big event back to the rebuilding of Solomon's temple in witchcraft uh, and Satanism. Solomon's their big guy, uh, the seal of Solomon, and uh, uh, many of the most powerful black magic grimoires are named after Solomon. And here in this book, it talks about a, a role, and this didn't happen because Asmodeus didn't help build the temple of God, but this is the dark side version of it, and it'll give us a little insight here. Let's just read a little. It says, I com this is Solomon speaking, I, supposedly, I commanded another demon be brought to me, and he, Beelzebul, brought me the demon Asmodeus. And it goes on to say, uh, the demon Asmodeus stated, I am the renowned Asmodeus. I cause the sickness of men to spread throughout the world. Have we seen any of that lately? Mm. I am always hatching plots against newlyweds. Divorce rate's pretty good, isn't it? I mar the beauty of virgins and cause their hearts to grow cold. And then what Solomon does through the use of the ring the old Lord of the Rings there, huh? But he says in, uh, and this is over in chapter 5, he says, As the Lord, the God of my father lives, you shall have irons to wear, and you shall mold clay for all the vessels of the temple. And according to this occult tradition and this writing and others, Asmodeus helped Solomon build the temple. Well, that is a big porky. But what is not a big porky is the role that Raphael is going to play not only with Azazel, Asmodeus, but in the final assault on the temple. The Freemasons talk about building the Temple of Solomon. In the, in the black magical tradition, Asmodeus helps to build the, the, the evil temple. Well, Raphael, who bound Azazel, who bound Asmodeus, he is going to jump in the middle of the final judgment on this temple that they're going to build. Now, and let's go back to the book of Tobit. There's something else here very, very interesting. And now God hath sent me to heal thee and Sarah, thy daughter-in-law. I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. Now, while Raphael is not mentioned by name in Scripture, we can take this Scripture in Tobit that identifies him as one of the holy angels, one of the seven that present the prayers of the saints. Now, let's go to the book of Revelation, and we can see 
Raphael right here, even though he is not mentioned by name. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Here we see what was described in the book of Tobit. We have the seven angels interceding, throwing the incense with the prayers of the saints, and these seven angels have the seven trumpets, and one of them we know from the book of Tobit is Raphael. And the smoke of the incense which came up with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God. Our prayers ascend before God, up to God, to heaven before him. The angels can ascend, but our prayers can. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And those voices were the squealing of Azazel's horde when the judgment of God is going to be poured out on them. The same Raphael that bound Azazel, that bound Asmodeus, he is going to throw the fire from the third heaven into the earth when the trumpets sound. He will be one of the seven that does that. And in verse 6 it says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And one of those is Raphael. And read the Bible what happens here. When these trumpets sound, it's going to get real, real serious here. And this is the time when you want to make sure you have the seal of God upon your forehead. We said last week or here recently, I know I said that maybe last week's broadcast, we should be more concerned about the mark of God than the mark of the beast. Mm, agreed. I, I have a question for you, David, going back to the Testament of Solomon. When do you suppose that was written? Uh, do you have any idea? I know there's a bunch of different ideas on that, but when when do you believe it was written pre-Messiah, pre-Second Temple, or post? I really don't know. I was just wondering because uh, I, I, was... I don't know, and I don't know if the scholars could give us an, a, a guesstimation but I don't know, but I know this tradition of Solomon having help from devils yeah. to build the temple, it's old. Yeah, it is it's old. old. And, and the thing that struck me when I read it, because I just read it the other day, actually, I've been going through the same book you got right there, the Old Testament, Pseudepigrapha, and all of that stuff. One of the things that struck me about it, there's like actually messianic prophecies in that book. Yeah. Because there's several angels that thwart different demons in there, right? And then there's this one that thwarts them all. It's like the one that thwarts every one of them. And it, they call him Emmanuel, right? He's the son of God. It's like a messianic prophecy within there. What I thought was interesting about it, too, is is Solomon, the rings, right? He has the rings. Uh, in, in the Lord of the Rings, Saruman is the one who has is trying to gain control of the, the rings. He's the, the white wizard or the head wizard of all of this stuff. It's really interesting. But, yeah, this is crazy. And now there's another book I was reading about rings as well, and they all seem to derive from the same exact stories. It's intense. The way people had to deal with demons pre-Jesus is pretty intense. And, and even in Tobit, you know, the way they had to deal with them. Pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. And we're going to, we'll give a little um, reference to this here, what John just uh, referenced. In the book of Tobit, chapter 6, as they went on their journey, they came in the evening to the river Tigris. And they lodged there. And when the young man went down to wash himself, a fish leaped out of the river and would have devoured him. Mm. Must have been pretty good fish, huh? <laughs> then the angel said unto him, Take the fish. And the young man laid hold of the fish and drew it to the land. See, there's symbolism here of the beast out of the sea, whom we defeat, of whom the angel said, Open the fish and take the heart and the liver and the gall and put them up safely. So the young man did as the angel commanded him, and when they had roasted the fish, they did eat it. Then they both went on their way till they drew near to Ekabante. Then the young man said to the angel, Brother Azizus, to what use is the heart and liver and the gall of the fish? And he said unto them, Touching the heart and the liver, if a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman and the party shall be no more vexed. Well, I guess here's where we just take the book of Tobit and just throw it out as crazy daisy, huh? Well, actually, this was legitimate. 
this is King James Apocrypha, and before Christ, we might call this a herbal remedy for devils. Yeah. That if you would obey what the angel said and do it with real faith, that it was a legitimate way of deliverance from the evil one. And now, it, and it's why the the apostles or the uh, disciples were so like overwhelmed. They're like, we can even control the demons in your name. Yeah. You know, he, 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 yeah. they were so surprised, and it was just because they did. They, I mean, demons were a real part of life back then, and you see in every culture, there's always these rights to get rid of them because they come and you know harass people and all these different things. And 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 it's so it's so interesting, man. It's just amazing. It is, and we remember from Scripture the seven sons of Sceva. Yeah. And they tried, yeah. they were Jewish exorcists that tried to cast out the devils without knowing Jesus, and they literally got their pants beat off of them. Yeah. By the guy literally, was, yeah. Yeah, literally was de-pantsed by the devil. That's in the Bible. You can read that. Uh, now, we're going to read an assessment here by Justin Martyr, who wrote very early in the second century, and his dialogue with Trifo which is a fascinating read. It's his debate with the first century or very late first century, early second century uh, Jewish rabbi. But what he says here, he says, Now assuredly, your exorcist, I have said, make use of craft when they exercise, even as the Gentiles do, and employ fumigations and incantations. Justin Martyr is referring to the Jewish practice of fumigation. And that was legitimate then, but after Christ came, that's not legitimate. We use the name of Jesus to cast out devils, and when they continued to try to do these things, and if people that do, you're liable to get your pants beat off. And Justin Martyr goes on to say, and I love this, he says, for every demon, when exercised in the name of this very Son of God, who is the firstborn of every creature, who became man by the virgin, who suffered and was crucified under Pontius Pilate by your nation, who died, who rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven, is overcome and subdued. There is victory in the name of Jesus. There's no victory in trying to smoke them out. We do it in the name of Jesus. And um, something else he says here that's so good. Justin Martyr goes on to say, but that they are angels and powers with whom the word of prophecy by David commands to lift up the gates that he who rose from the dead, Jesus Christ, the Lord of hosts, according to the will of the Father, might enter the word of of David has likewise showed. And this is so important. Justin Martyr here quoting Psalm 24, and let's just read it. It has to do with everything we're talking about tonight. The counterfeit attempts of ascent into the third heaven, Jesus Christ. Nobody ascends, but who I will let ascend. Look at Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord, who shall stand in his holy place. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him. Thy face, O Jacob, Salah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Whatever problem you have right now, it will be resolved, and you will have the victory over it if you will just open up the gates of your heart and let the King of glory come in and understand that you have the ability by faith to ascend. Ephesians 2, 6, you have been seated with him in heavenly places. Colossians 3 and 1, if ye then are risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace. We can ascend into that third heaven by faith, and that is what gripes. Azazel and his nasty little horde 
to the uttermost. Not only can we ascend and he can't, we have victory over Azazel and all of his hordes through the name of Jesus. We have something better than to smoke them little rascals out. We can, in the name of Jesus, have authority over all of Azazel's horde. Amen. Now let's look at the goaty little fella here and um, the actual horde of Azazel. And in Leviticus 17, 7, and they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Look that word up, and you'll find that that is the word satire. We talked about this also in another ride not too long ago. It literally is the goat devil. And these came about through the actual, they were the children of Azazel. Through Azazel and, um, you know, the, the bestiality and the things that they do. After whom they have gone a-whoring, this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. So these devils that were actual worship, these half-human, half-goats, they were the children of Azazel. You know, he's the goaty little fella, just like the picture on the thumbnail. You know, I said, Adam, we want to, this, this is a goaty little guy. So, you know, that's what this guy needs to look about, and boy, did Adam capture it so good. Now, here we have the picture of the Baphomet, and this was first done as a wood carving by Eliphas Levi. He was a defrocked Catholic priest and a Freemason, and uh, probably one of the most preeminent uh, black magicians of all time. And he drew this Baphomet. Well, it was originally a wood carving, and here it is presented as a statue. Uh, we see, uh, disgustingly, it has both male and female body parts. It's got the right-hand path, and it's got the left-hand path. So if you want to turn to the left or to the right, we're not to turn to the left or the right, but you can follow the Baphomet to the left or to the right, you see. Mm -hmm. Or you can seek first the kingdom. We see the torch of illumination coming out of his head. And this Baphomet was first used by the Knights Templar. The, the ass worship began with the head of an ass, and as it progressed, it became the head of the goat. And we see here the male and female body parts, and there's an obvious message to this, isn't there? And there's a book here written by James Wasserman, and James Wasserman is a member of the Ordo Templar Orientis of uh, at the time he wrote this book, I think he said he'd been in the OTO for 25 years. And he wrote this book on the Templars and the Assassins. And just like Eliphas Levi, these guys, uh, it takes one to know one, I guess you could say. But this is what he wrote on page 242 of this book. He said, the Gnostic model of the bisexual an androgynous nature of divinity, and over and over we have hammered and rebuked the Kabbalistic and Gnostic teachings of the androgynous bisexual God. Right here it is. That's the bisexual God of the Kabbalah and the Gnostics. It's the Baphomet. That's the really, you know, if anyone is ass worshipers, they're the ass worshipers, literally. It says the Gnostic model of the bisexual and androgynous nature of divinity has long been taken by various sects as an endorsement of both heterosexual and homosexual contact between adherents. In other words, what he's saying, that Baphomet symbolizes our right to be homosexual, to be bisexual, to be whatever we want, because man was created in the image of God, and that's our God. Yeah. That's what we worship. That's bisexual. So by golly, if I'm bisexual and homosexual, I'm being what God wants me to be. This is what it is. This guy's got it in the wrong way, but he's got the facts right. The Gnostic model of the bisexual and androgynous nature of divinity has long been taken by various sects as an endorsement of both heterosexual and homosexual contact between adherents. The idea that the Templars were infused with an earlier broad-based sexual, magical paganism whose universality extends through Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Kabbalistic Judaism, Taoism, the 16th century witch cults, 
and the 20th century activities of Gerald Gardner and Aleister Crowley may seem fanciful, yet something like this is exactly what we are contemplating. That's exactly what they're saying. This is the God all the way from the Knights Templar down to the Crowleys. They're all worshiping the same God. This is the God of Gnosticism, the God of Kabbalistic Judaism, and this is all a spirit of Azazel taking us the same place of the ascent of this dark power to once again, and they believe they can actually storm the throne room. We're going to show you uh, this in just in just a moment. Now, in this book, *The Transcendental Magic*, which was written by Lapis Levi, who did the the original word car wood carving of the Baphomet, on page one sixty eight, he says this: the symbolic head of the goat of Mendes is occasionally given to this figure. And it is then the Baphomet of the Templars and the word of the Gnostics, bizarre images which became scarecrows for the vulgar after affording food for reflections to sages. Now, we'll see here a little thing that uh, some of you old rock and rollers uh, might remember. Remember the Rolling Stones, Mick Jagger, I think this came out in 1971 goat's head soup now you've probably never seen this album cover before this was the original album cover and you talk about nasty i mean this is nasty we got the gold head in the cauldron you don't miss the symbolism here now this was so radical that very few uh if you've got one of these albums in vinyl with this cover, you've got something worth some money because it was pulled very quickly. And then the other um, picture, it looks like Mick Jagger going through a portal on the, the cover that was finally put out. But this is what it's all about. It's the goat's head soup. That's what the, the children of Azazel are cooking up for you, a little goat's head soup. And that's what they want you to eat. You know what's interesting, David? And of course, we talked a little bit about this on one of our Book of Enoch's, but goats and you know jesus in matthew i believe it's matthew 25 when he separates the sheep from the goats right he, he makes a clear line sheep from the goats now i want to i want to just want to say this and i i i'm a i i have animals i have sheep and i have goats both of the two uh i will tell you this i've never once seen a homosexual sheep that i've had <coughs> but the goats they prefer each other men and they always are all, always humping, always. I mean, this is no, this is no joke. They're all literally always humping. And it, you look at Pan, you know, Pan and the satire, the the sexual prow, prowess of the of Pan, the uh, the half goat, half man, uh, and all of that. It just really makes you wonder. And I think I think that show we did on on the bow in the Book of Enoch really like kind of lines out this the whole goat thing. But it's so crazy. But I, I don't know if any of you guys have animals like that, but. If you have two male goats, you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm telling you right now, it's it's unreal. I don't know if that has any relevance to anything, but it's just unreal. <laughs> so, yeah. And and the people on the dark side, the ass and the goat, they were their phallic animals. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it's not very pretty. And uh, it, it and it's so easy to see um, the craziness that's going on. We have, uh, there's a lawsuit underway in California from a young child that was told and coerced by its teachers that it was the wrong sex. The little child tried to kill itself by hanging, oh, tried to hang itself, commit suicide. There's a lawsuit underway. There's uh, another lawsuit underway, in, it's in California also, where there was a little child that got into a teacher group. And this teachers, they had a little group of kids they thought would be susceptible to this, and they convinced this child that it was of the wrong sex. They actually sent a letter home to the parents that this is your child's new name, that uh, it doesn't want to be called by its name. It knows it's the wrong sex. This is your child's new name. Well, thank God the parents, uh, they didn't like that too well. And they, that lawsuit is also... Uh, you know, in, in progress. I mean, I, I can't believe they're just lost. I mean, if, if that happened to me, man, there were, you guys would hear about me on the news. It would be 
bad. I mean, the, like the fact that they ruined this child's life completely like that. I mean, they they deserve death, really. They I mean, do. just no, there's no, there's no excuse for that. Stepping over bounds is is even just it's a understatement. I mean, that's what they're doing though. They're, you know, you've seen the teachers rise up. We should be able to teach whatever we want to the kids who gives them the right to yeah. teach the kids anything who gives them the right. There are kids. They're not your kids. You know what I mean? If you are a teacher and you think you have the right to teach my child, anything you want, you're going to find out. And I hope that other parents stand up too. Cause man, this is crazy world. Yeah. Yeah. When I became a Christian, homosexuality was still illegal in several States. Yeah. And now, it's illegal to say anything against it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where we're at. Uh, could it be the spirit of Azazel and the spirit of the goat has been released? Something's going on. Well, the Democrats got the donkey right up on everything they oh, do. Oh, so. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I never even thought of that, John. Oh, oh no. That, oh, the donkey. Oh. <laughs> 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 Says a lot, doesn't it? Oh, it does. That yeah. might say more than we think, huh? Yeah. Now let's let's just connect some more dots here. Now we did a show called Clot Shot Fever where we talked about mesmerism and the use and and the what I believe a definite ploy to put metals in our bodies that they can be used for mind control. And we're going to connect uh, and we talked in that broadcast about the theory Mesmer had, that he believed that there was a universal fluid within all people and within all everything, the same as the vril or the prana, that it can be controlled with magnetism. Mm. Now, here is where science falsely so-called in the occult kiss. But And this is something I've read this for years, but until I did deeper research into mesmerism, I didn't really understand all this what's being said here. But let's, let's read a little bit, see if some dots connect. Pike says on page 734, this force was known to the ancients. It is a universal agent whose supreme law is equilibrium and where if science can but learn how to control it it will be possible to change the order of the seasons now what a statement mm. this force has been known for a long time and if science can learn how to control it it can change the seasons could be a super weapon couldn't it he goes on to say this agent partially revealed by the blind guesses of the disciples of Mesmer is precisely what the adepts of the Middle Ages call the elementary matter of the great work. The Gnostics held that it composed the ingenious body of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy, blank, rank blasphemy. And it was adored in the secret rites of the Shabbat in the temple under the hieroglyphic figure of Baphomet or the hermaphroditic goat of Mendez. There is a life principle of the world, a universal agent, wherein are two natures and a double current of love and wrath. This ambient fluid penetrates everything. Mm. This is exactly what the ancient uh, writers of the ancient Vedic texts believe. This is the power Hitler sought after. Is this the power that Tesla found? Is uh, You see, the same thing that Pike says, if the scientists could control this stuff, they, they could just rule the world. This is exactly what these Luciferian, satanic occultists, they are trying to manipulate this same force. Call it prana, call it real, call it evil. Going on to say, this ambient fluid penetrates everything. It is a ray detached from the glory of the sun and fixed by the weight of the atmosphere and the central attraction. It is the body of the Holy Spirit, the universal agent, the serpent devouring its own tail. Within this electromagnetic ether, this vital and luminous caloric, the ancients and alchemists were familiar. He said more there than we realize. Uh, my goodness. And this, you know, every Freemason that uh, this is also published in a book called Bridge to Light, which is published by the Scottish Rite, uh, the, the, the Scottish Rite organization. 
And in this picture in the Scottish Rite, there is a picture, we've seen it here before, of the white Jehovah, black Jehovah with the snake around it, swallowing its own tail. That snake is what they're calling the Holy Spirit. That's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. And every Freemason that supports the Scottish Rite, you are distributing blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Get ready for hell, because that's where you're going. Mm. And there's a lot of them too. I think like, well, I don't remember, we talked about it before, how many percentage of just Southern, in the Southern Baptist church, how many, what was the percentage? It was like, it was a very high percentage. It was high. They estimate to as high as 50%. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's unreal, man. I, it, the fact that all of this stuff is swept under the rug, ignored, all of that just shows, shows us where we're at in, in time here. I mean, it just shows us that people are really, really, really just ready to accept um, whatever deception comes their way, just it's just a plain as day, you know, plain yeah. as day, right in their face, and they don't even see it. So, yeah, you know, that's that's one reason that I I love that we're doing this because a lot of people, if they've heard this stuff in church, who things might be different. You know, you're never going to hear this stuff in church. You're never going to hear anybody talk about anything to do with anything that really has any substance, other than you might hear the gospel, and you might hear the gospel, and you might not, you might hear a false gospel. It's it's so indoctrinated and messed up, man. We people always say, "Why are you guys always against the church?" It's because it's not the church anymore. It's not. No. It, it is basically light Gnosticism. I mean, it's Gnosticism for the uninitiated, uninitiated is what it is, and it's become such a such a sad state. Just no education there, not educating people at all. Um, I, I, what can I say? I know that's going off on a rabbit trail a little bit, but it well, really, it really shows not, the time. It's not. It's spot on. You know, you got the right hand or the left. They've turned to the right hand and not the left. But the right hand or the left, they wind up in the same place. Yeah. You know, there's only the straight and narrow way. If you're in the church, that gives Freemasons the right hand of fellowship. Repent and get out of it. Mm. If you're in a church that celebrates Christmas and Easter, repent and get out of it. If you're in a church that says the law has passed away, repent and get out of it. If you're in a church that does not teach the doctrine of Christ and the commandments of God, repent and get out of it. If you're in a church that does not say that each and every word that Jesus spoke applies to you, repent and get out of it. Turn or burn. You will turn or you will burn. The judgment of God will be upon you. Only the straight and narrow gate is going to lead you to salvation. The right hand or the left won't do it. Only that straight and narrow gate. Two more scriptures. Leviticus 16.10. We've referred to this. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat until the wilderness. The word here in the Hebrew Masoretic text translated, translated scapegoat is a zazel. We've talked in this presentation tonight how a zazel had the knowledge of making weapons. Mm-hmm. We talked last week about Trump uh, possessing the papers, supposedly, of Tesla's super weapon. That's a comforting thought, isn't it? We've talked tonight in the book of Jasher how it says that at the Tower of Babel, they wanted to storm the very throne room of God and take over. Well, look what happens at Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their army gathered to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. When Jesus returns, they're going to try to shoot him out of the sky. Well, that's not going to work out too well for them. <laughs> it's not going to work out too well for them at all. But this is what the hordes of Azazel think they can do. They think they can defeat God. But they are so, so wrong. Mm. They are so, so wrong. And I think with that, John, we're going to conclude our ride for this week right here. Very good, man. That was awesome. Fantastic stuff. Um, make sure you guys hit the like button. We do this thing called the Pounder's Pound where you smash the like button, pound the like button, actually, uh, but this helps in the algorithm, helps people, helps YouTube know that other people want to see this. So please do this with us. If you like this show at all, hit the like button for us, please. And also subscribe. 
make sure to check out our other content. But David, what a fantastic show. Before we do this, I just want to say what a fantastic show. I think this kind of brings full circle into this idea of, of Azazel. Um, you know, in Enoch, I think it's 10 and 8, where it talks about ascribing all sin to Azazel. All yeah. sin will be ascribed yeah. to him. Yeah. Uh, this is the same thing we see in this the, the Day of Atonement ritual. Like you said earlier, Day of Atonement is a very solemn feast and and really just um, the way it's been fulfilled in the scripture yeah. with with Jesus is is amazing and and I, I I know that a lot of people are hesitant about some of these books and but you know the book of Enoch is one of these books that is really I believe one just like it says in the book is for a remote generation a final generation it's for a generation that's yet to come. And I believe this is, this is the generation that it's for, because look, when you look at the book of Enoch and, and I know this is, this show's not necessarily just about it, book of Enoch, but I remember the first time I read it, David, and maybe I don't know about how your experience was with it, but the first time I read it, I instantly like looked at the world completely different. Yeah. Everything made sense a little bit better after I read it. Yeah. And I read it for the first time in the seventies, out of my big R.H. Charles book, you've seen my big, thick R.H. Charles book yeah. about this thick. Yeah. And I've had that since the 70s, and I read it, and you just know that, boy, there's something special here. Yeah, you really do. There, there's something here that's real. Yeah. And, uh, and so many things that we've learned through our Enoch commentary study that has really given us valuable insight into fighting the kingdom of darkness and mm. just like this you know we can see a uh we can see the enemy coming at us right here and we can pray and uh have a little better idea how to pray against this guy for sure and and we're gonna do the pounders pound also i want you guys to check out fojcradio.com that's uh, david and donna's website they have tons of teachings that they've had for over 30 years worth of stuff in that uh, website, different resources. Uh, you can check out nystv.org. Make sure to check out our other channels such as Cutting Edge, Remnant Restoration, uh, Underground Church. Uh, what is what? What else? I'm missing. There's a lot. We got a lot going <laughs> we got, on. We all, if you go to fojcradio.com, we got a variety on channel, a Rumble channel, Underground Church channel. Yeah, we got links there to uh, John and Patty Hall. Uh, Babylon breaking. We got stuff going on all over the place. Yeah, and it's everywhere. You know, we're going to work hard to get the truth out and uh, send out that message of repentance to he that hath an ear, letting pure doctrine of Christ. Uh, Jimmy Vision. Uh, yeah, we got a lot going on. We've got a multifaceted assault on the kingdom of darkness, and we will not turn to the right hand to the left. Straight ahead. No time to play around, that's for sure. No, no so plan B. Let's let's not play around with this smashing of the like button. You guys ready to do this? Here we go. Ready, Dirty David. One, two, three, boom. Boom. Smack move. Man, I heard that one. Did you hear it all? I around? heard that. Rumbling. So thank you guys so much. We enjoy you guys. David, uh, end us out. We love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank to each and every one of you for supporting the Midnight Ride. Now you see TV FOJC for being the greatest live audience in the world. We thank you so much, and we appreciate your love for the Lord and your quest for the truth. So until next week, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up.